I like to start this session this way. If you asked the average Christian, why is the world so wicked? Why is humanity so depraved? Why is the world the mess that it is, <laughs> okay? The answer you're gonna invariably get is the fall, okay? The fall. The fall gets blamed for everything. If you asked an Israelite or a first century Jew the same question, hey, why is the world so wicked? Why is the world such a mess? Why do we have this chaos and suffering and so on and so forth, you know, sin? That is not the answer you would get. The Israelite and the first century Jew would not just say, well, it's the fall, Genesis 3. The answer you would get is, well, there's actually three reasons why the world is the way it is. The first one is the fall. They would acknowledge that. The fall is the entrance of rebellion into God's good world, both on a supernatural level, because we have a supernatural being that decides to interfere and impede with what God wants for humanity in Genesis. But there are also two other rebellions. There are two other reasons why the world is the way it is. And these other two reasons, you have a rebellion in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, with the sons of God, and you have what happens at Babel. Unfortunately, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a little bit as to why this is in a moment, but again, it's been my experience that the second one of these, the sons of God episode, is regularly either ignored in the church or demythologized. Uh, it's explained away as something other than a supernatural rebellion. So you never get this part of the Israelite Jewish worldview. The Genesis 6 episode is a huge deal in intertestamental literature, which bleeds into the New Testament because the New Testament writers are part of what we call the Second Temple period. You get the temple rebuilt after the return from exile, all the way into 70 AD when it's destroyed again. That period, the New Testament is part of that. What happens in Genesis 6 is a really, really big deal in their view of depravity that overspreads the earth. So if we sort of don't have that one count, <clears throat> if we sort of remove that from the picture, we, we miss some significant elements to not only understand certain things in the New Testament, but also certain things in the old. The third one, Babel, this is a Sunday school story that everybody knows. I didn't run into Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9 until I was a doctoral student, as far as what in the world is going on there. And part of the reason is because our modern English translations do not utilize the Dead Sea Scrolls in those verses, and in other verses in Deuteronomy 32 as well. So we never see what the text originally had there and why it's important because Paul and others dip into Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9 with a fair amount of regularity. And that passage is the foundation for what we today loosely call spiritual warfare. But you'll never see it unless, again, you have like the Dead Sea Scrolls to help you. You'll never see it. Even though Paul alludes to it in Acts 17, you'll just never see it. You won't, it'll look like what Paul's saying has no context for it, like he's just making something up. Because I can't find that in the Old Testament. Again, it's a textual issue, it's a manuscript issue. But all three of these, again, would be the Israelite Jewish explanation for why the world is the mess that it is. And as far as what Again, pun intended, I'm so clever. The fallout of the three rebellions, the three falls, if you will. The first one, what that incurs to humanity is estrangement from God and death. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, so by one man sin into the world and death by sin, so that death passed 
upon all men. By the way, it doesn't say guilt there. It says death. Death passed upon all men. So we have an estrangement from God and we have a death problem. The second one is viewed, again, by Second Temple period Jews as a root cause of the proliferation of depravity. It's not that humans aren't depraved because they fell in Genesis 3. They, they, it was, these were willful acts of rebellion. And you have plenty of other willful acts of sin that, that ensue from it. But Genesis 6 was thought to be about the proliferation, the acceleration of depravity among human beings. And in the Old Testament period, it was a lethal threat that arose from this event to the people of God as the people of God were known then, the Israelites. And the third one is really about abandonment and fragmentation of God, and not only God to the rest of humanity besides Israel, but really all of the nations from each other, and especially to God. Now, if you were a Second Temple period Jew, and your, your answer to why the world is the, is the mess that it is, were these three things, you expect the Messiah to cure all three problems, not just one. You expect the Messiah to not just fix Genesis 3, but to fix the others. And that is actually what you get in the New Testament. It's just that we're sort of blind to the other two. So I want to talk a little bit about each of these. Again, if you're one of my people, if you're an academic and love books with footnotes, Unseen Realm has an awful lot of data. I have a whole book that's going to be, the title's going to be Demons, but it's not going to be out for a while. I've already turned it in. Who knows what the publisher's going to do there? They'll do something. But that's going to have a, a truckload of data in it as well. And so those are the two sources. But Unseen Realm is out, and you can get more detail if you want it. Now, what I want to say about the first rebellion is that if I asked you, hey, you know that story in Genesis 3 about the serpent? Who was the serpent? Like, like every Christian is going to say, well, that was, that was Satan. It was the devil. In other words, the serpent there was more than a snake. Now, every Christian that I've ever met affirms that idea. But you'd be amazed at how much resistance there is in the academy to saying, to reading Genesis 3 that way. Again, I'm not going to go into why that is, but if you're, if you're going to check up on Mike after today's meeting, oh, a lot of scholars don't agree with that. I'm telling you that already. I, I already know. And the reasons for doing so are things I address in books and you know, take apart their answer and show why it's not really a good, you know, answer. But the New Testament is one. We're dealing with more than a snake. In other words, Genesis 3 is not teaching us a zoology lesson. It's not teaching us a lesson about the evolution of snakes. You'll read that in creationist literature. Oh, the serpent originally had legs and uh, cursed to the ground. No, it, look, it's not teaching us about some development of a creature. It's not about zoology. It's not about biology. Again, we could go into all sorts of imagery about this being. And I could show you all sorts of data about how both in Mesopotamia and Egypt, supernatural throne guardians, they guarded the presence of the deity, were cast as serpents or dragons. Because those are dangerous. <laughs> Okay, like if I was, if I was writing a, a story now and, and providing illustrations and I wanted to talk about bodyguards, I wouldn't put like a bunch of guys that wait up, you know, like they look like they're teenagers and, you know, they're not muscular. I mean, you're going to draw those, those individuals as, as bad looking dudes because we just have this association with bodyguards and security, you know, especially around, you know, kings and whatnot. They're, they're armed to the teeth. They're a threat. If you step out of line, you're going to pay the price. This is the standard way, or one of the standard ways, of describing a throne guardian in the ancient world. So what we have here is we have an individual, an entity, and you can read Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, 
that has close proximity to God. But in Isaiah 14, this individual decides, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, I, will, I want to be like the Most High. I will be the Most High. I want to be the one in charge of this. I don't like God's decision to make humans part of our family. Okay, I want to be the ruler of the council. You know, you'll get language like this in these passages, where Eden is the, is the cosmic mountain, the, the place where God dwells. Again, portrayed as a mountain because it's remote and transcendent. You have this individual rebelling and being cast out, cast away, but not before enticing humanity to rebel. So we have rebellion in the supernatural world and the human world. Revelation 12 and 20, this individual is identified as the serpent or the devil, God's original, the original rebel who becomes sort of God's original adversary. And the cost of his rebellion is death to humanity and estrangement, separation from God. But the heart of the story is a supernatural rebellion. It's not a lesson about snakes and about biology and zoology. Now, this chart here is hard to read. It's, in, it's from Unseen Realm. But all I want you to notice is the right-hand column. I have red, green, and yellow. Those are places where Genesis 3, Isaiah 14, and Ezekiel 28 overlap. It's a good number of places. On the left-hand side, you have Hebrew terms for the dwelling place of God. Again, Eden is more than a garden. The serpent is more than a snake. These are images designed to convey the dwelling place of God. God actually came to earth. He created people to be in there, you know, in, on the earth with him, with his supernatural family. One of them was a rebel and brings death because Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden, driven away from the presence of God, away from the tree of life, the thing which gave them, the two things which gave them contingent immortality that is lost. It's not just a story about snakes and people in a garden. There's transcendent imagery here that, that takes us into the supernatural thought processes. What it really you know, is trying to get at is chaos, disruption, disorder began in this place. It began in God's home. And the result was humanity now is going to live in a broken world. They're the product of a broken home. It's not what God wants it to be. We scholars use words like chaos to describe every, every condition or set of conditions that is contrary to the way God wants things. And this is where it begins. It's a disruption in, what, in the way God wants things. The serpent figure is cast down. Okay, in all three accounts, Genesis 3, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, cast out of the presence of God to the earth. Now the earth, interestingly enough, one of the Hebrew words for earth is Eretz. It's the same word or one of the same words that can be used to describe the realm of the dead, the underworld, the bad side of the spiritual world. The serpent figure becomes Lord of the dead in Israelite thinking. Why? Because from this moment on, everything dies. The earth is not what it should be. It's cursed because of what happens here. It's going to decay and corrupt and be the contrary, the opposite of what God wants it to be. It's death. If you like stranger things, think of the upside down. Okay? It's a place of decay. The very air is like a contagion. It's pathogenic. I mean, all these things. It, it's death personified. And its Lord, its keeper, becomes known in scripture and in other texts, even, even texts that aren't in the Bible, 
as Lord of the dead. He owns humanity. He owns their destiny from this point on because separated from God, they will die and they'll stay dead. So the Messiah is supposed to fix this. The realm of death you could think of also as decreation. Think of the reverse of what happens in Eden. In Eden, God brings life. He creates. He brings it into being. It's in perfect harmony with him. As a result of Genesis 3, all of that is reversed. Everything is the opposite. This is why later on in the Bible, inhospitable and uninhabitable places will be described with underworld terminology like Sheol, the grave. The wilderness is uninhabitable. The wilderness is where the demonic lives because if you go out there, you'll die. It's the realm of the dead. Again, all these things are, are, are metaphorical to convey a certain idea about the way God wants life to be and the way it unfortunately is in our world. You know, you, you read through, you know, the Old Testament. I have a few examples here. If you read Isaiah 13, this is why you get desert creatures. The writer uses the vocabulary of desert creatures to describe demonic beings. It's not that owls and hyenas are demonic beings. It's that they eat dead things. They're unclean. They are death personified in some way. And where they live is where place, things go to die. Everything that's threatening, everything that's in decay, everything that's dead is the anti-Eden. It's the other side. Again, Stranger Things, it's the upside down. It's, it's the inversion of the way things are supposed to be. There's a certain logic to this. In the Day of Atonement ceremony with Azazel, and you could go to, might as well go to Leviticus 16, this may be unfamiliar to some. If you go to Leviticus 16, again, everybody knows this is the, um, the Day of Atonement passage. The one time of year, Aaron, you know, goes into the Holy of Holies. It says, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats, remember the two goats, and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord, preposition, divine name, and the other lot is for Azazel. What in the world is that? I mean, a lot of translations have for the scapegoat. Okay, Azazel is actually a proper name. In Second Temple literature, Azazel is Satan. It's the devil figure. It's, it's, it's the figure in charge of the dead. It's the anti, you know, God, the anti, the, the flip equivalent of Eden. And you say, what, are they offering sacrifices to Satan? No. Look at what happens. The goat for Azazel, Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord. That's the one that's killed and uses a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. What does the high priest do to the goat for Azazel? He puts his hands on it, symbolically transferring the sins of the nation. Because the Day of Atonement is like hitting the reset button, okay? It's rebooting. He puts his hands on the head of the goat for Azazel and they send it out into the wilderness, the place where death is. Because that's where sin belongs. It doesn't belong in the camp, okay, where the people of God are and the presence of God is. It belongs out there. They send, they don't, they're not offering to Satan, they're sending sin to where it belongs. Get it out of here. This is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 when, he, when they have to discipline a, a, a believer who's unrepentant for you know, immorality, they have to discipline this, this guy out of the church. 
that he's delivered unto Satan. It means he's sent out of the place that is holy ground, the church, because the glory of God dwells within each believer. We don't want sin here. We send it out. If the sin's taken care of, then he can come back in. This is just a little portion of what the Old Testament describes as, and we're going to get into in detail, cosmic geography. There's a sense of things that are holy and sacred, sacred space, and either normal profane space or evil space. Things under the dominion of God and his presence and things under the dominion of something else. It's just illustrated here in this part of the ceremony for Azazel. I mean, you read that and that sounds just kind of weird. Goat for Azazel, what in the world's that? He's out in the wilderness because that's the realm of death. That, look at the desert, dude. Does that look like Eden looked? No. Okay, that's the whole idea. The Rephaim spirits. Just go to one passage here, because we'll talk about who the Rephaim are in a minute. But also in the underworld, in Sheol, that's the Hebrew word for the underworld, Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. This is God's words to the supernatural rebel, Isaiah 14, who rebels, wants to be like the Most High, and instead is brought low, brought down to the earth and down to the underworld. Right up here, just go up to verse, uh, verse 9. Sheol stirred up in, to meet you. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol. You become weak as we, become like one of us. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. It's Hebrew is Halal ben Shikar. Halal means shining one. The Latin translation in the Vulgate is Lucifer. That's what Lucifer means in Latin, shining one. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn? The, the dawn? How are you cut down to the ground? Again, you're made low. And even, even lower than the ground, you're in the Eretz, you're in, you're in Sheol, you're in the underworld. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Okay. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, but you are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. Now, if you look at other passages, let me see if I can find it here, if I can find my mouse. Uh, let's see, let's go down one. Uh, let's see, references to the grave and the dead in Isaiah 14. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, let's see. Leaders of the earth. The shades right here. Let's just click on that. That's the term Rephaim. Where, have we, where will you see that term if you know your Old Testament well? Who are the Rephaim? It's one of the names for the giant clans. Why are they in Sheol? Why are they in the realm of the dead here? Because they got killed. You say, well, who cares? Let's go to the second rebellion. <laughs> here's, here's why you'll care. I'm pointing this out because that verse in Isaiah 14 is going to be one of two or three verses in the Old Testament for the origin of demons. Genesis 6-4 is a controversial passage. The sons of God see the daughters of men. They cohabit with the daughters of men. They have children by them. The children are called the Nephilim, mighty men of renown upon the earth. Now, what's typically done in churches today is, <clears throat> well, the sons of God there are just people, you know, the line of Seth or somebody else, or they're kings, and there's no, nothing supernatural going on here, and it's just kind of weird anyway. Like, like, how would we have a you know, supernatural rebellion here and cohabitation and the giants and all that stuff? That's just too weird, so that can't be, it can't be what the writers intended because it offends us. And so let's just sort of get rid of that. 
and that's what's done. Now, there are a lot of problems with that. It means the daughters of men are the, are the evil line and the men aren't evil. You know, the women are evil, but the men aren't. That's one problem <clears throat> if you're going to go down that road. But here's the bigger problem in Genesis 6. Peter and Jude disagree. Peter, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world, the ungodly. And then he goes to Sodom and Gomorrah. He realized this is a chronology. Genesis 6, 4, 1 through 4, then the flood, then Sodom and Gomorrah. Angels that sinned, plural. It's not referring to Satan because it's plural. There is no other candidate for what Peter's talking about. You say, well, what about a third of the angels, you know, rebelling with Satan? There isn't a single verse in the Bible that says that. Not one. The only time you ever get the word third and angel in the same verse is the last book of the Bible, Revelation 12, where it refers to war breaking out in heaven at the birth of the Messiah, which is a long time after the flood. Peter and Jude with him, Jude basically says the same thing, describes a supernatural rebellion before the flood, Genesis 6, 1 through 4, the offenders of which were cast into hell and imprisoned there in chains of gloomy darkness. Now, do you notice something already? Where do they get this chains of gloomy darkness business? Because if I remember Genesis 6, let's just go there. Man began to multiply in the face of the land. Daughters were born of them. Sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were attractive, took them wives. The Lord said, hey, my spirit's not going to abide man forever. His flesh is going to give him 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. And you keep going. Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Lord regretted what he did. He goes to Noah, and then we get the flood. Where, where's, where are the chains of gloomy darkness? They're not there. And that tells us that Peter and Jude are getting that idea, that material, from somewhere else. They're drawing on material not in the Old Testament, but they're drawing on some other piece of literature or a tradition, a wider tradition, about Genesis 6. Peter and Jude are drawing directly, actually, on ancient Jewish books like First Enoch, Jubilees, and the Book of Giants, all from the Second Temple period, and they're all part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So Peter and Jude are reading Jewish books essentially commentary on the Old Testament on this episode of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And they bring some of that material into their own writings in the New Testament. That's where they get it. Newsflash. New Testament writers, biblical writers, read books. <laughs> I mean, we have this weird mythical idea that the Bible guys, they never read anything. They just were kind of like making breakfast one day and then they got zapped and they went into a trance and then they, and they woke up and there's a scroll in front of them and it's like, man, I can't wait to read that. I can't wait to read what I just wrote. I wasn't aware that I wrote it because my brain was disengaged. I was getting downloaded. Okay, the Bible, some of you will get this reference. The Bible is not a channeled book. It is not the book of Arantia. Okay, the Bible is a book produced by people whom God providentially prepared for the task. That's what it is. And they read books, they are informed by their environment, their culture, stuff they read, and God knows all of that's going on. 
He's preparing them from the time they're born up until the moment when he prompts them to produce something for posterity that becomes part of that thing we call the Bible. It's not just downloaded like their brains were not engaged. You know, we, we really have a deeply flawed conception of inspiration if you think that the Bible is a channeled book. It makes you very vulnerable to criticism and it makes the Bible vulnerable to criticism in all sorts of ways. Again, this is one of those, it'll take me five minutes to destroy your view of the Bible. By using the Bible and using the presumption of how you think you got it. It's not hard. It happens in university classrooms every week. Okay, it's not hard to do. And in this case, Peter and Jude read books. And this material that they're reading, here's the neat part. They providentially read material that actually preserved the original context for Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Because Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is there for a reason. It's not that, again, man, I'm four verses short. You know, I got, a, I got a verse count here. You know, what should I stick in here? Let's like give them a really weird thing. You know, I don't play with their minds a little bit. No, there's a, there's a point to why the verses are there. But the context is lost on us. The Old Testament writer assumes his readers will, will sort of pick up what he's laying down. And some of them did because they write about it later and Peter and Jude use those works and they actually recover the original context. Since the 19th century, we've known that Mesopotamian flood stories are very similar to the Bible's flood stories. If you went to college, I can guarantee if you took a religion class, you heard this. Because people love to use this as a wedge between you and your idea that the Bible's different than other literature. Okay, this is sort of a favorite trajectory. Similarities with other, with other documents. This has been well known since the 19th century. The biblical story records an event, but it also does theology. The flood story isn't, just, isn't designed just to tell you there was a flood. The flood story is actually making a theological point, and that's actually what's happening in the first four, really the first five verses of the account. The writer is shooting at something. And what he's shooting at is Mesopotamian religion. He's shooting at some other gods when he does it. But again, that's a context that lost to us. It wasn't lost to Peter and Jude or the, the writers of that other literature. So again, books like Enoch preserve this. Here, here's, to, to get us into this subject, I like to, to do it this way. We just read Genesis 6, 1 through 4, this weird sons of God stuff that Peter and Jude take at face value, okay? It's just weird, all right? And if it's weird, it must be important, and it is. But look at verse five. Like, what does this have to do with the first four verses? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man, wait a minute, I thought the sons of God were the bad guys. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, how do you go from the sons of God violating the, the boundary between heaven and earth? You know, how do you go from a supernatural rebellion to every, all the people being wicked all the time? What, what's going on here? How do you go from one to the other? If you knew the backstory, you wouldn't ask the question. So we're going to go into the backstory. You know, you have the Second Temple writers who are acquainted with that. And in Second Temple Judaism, again, the Judaism that is from when the Second Temple was built all the way to the first century in Jesus' day, they believed that the events here in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 was responsible for the proliferation of human depravity. They believed that there was a connection between the first four verses and verse 5 because they knew the backstory. Now, the backstory, again, in verses like Enoch, will, or passages like Enoch, will talk about the fall of the sons of God. They're called watchers in Enoch's language. And, you know, Book of Daniel uses that term too. We just read that, you know, a little while ago. They have the watchers descend either to or from Mount Hermon, which if you've ever been to Israel, you've probably seen Mount Hermon. You can't miss it. It's the tallest peak there is in that area. It's usually snow-capped. 
We're going to talk about Mount Hermon when we get to Jesus and cosmic geography because Jesus visits there and he has a reason for doing it. And he has things to say when he's there. That again, if you know the backstory, you know why he goes there. Okay? He has a purpose. It's, it's cosmic turf. It, it has an evil, a deeply evil association. So the watchers in the Enoch version, they transgress with women and they teach humanity to destroy themselves. If we, if we read the book of Enoch here, we would read something that sounds really close to Genesis 6, but it ends, the story ends with, and when they came down, you know, to mingle with humans, they taught them skills and technologies for warfare, like how to, how to make swords and knives and spears, you know, for warfare, and the art of warfare. They taught them all about plants and herbs to intoxicate themselves, drugs, okay? to produce altered states. They taught them astrology. They taught them arts of seduction to proliferate immorality. They taught them all these things. And again, Enoch, because he's Jewish, you know, he's like, this is, this is terrible. What they taught humans accelerated depravity. It broke up homes. It resulted in bloodshed. It turned their hearts to idolatry, you know, through producing these altered states and visiting the spiritual realms and all this kind of stuff. You know, there, there's a whole list of sins in the Old Testament that you can put under those four categories. The, these rebels are specifically blamed for kickstarting human self destruction, accelerating it giving humans more opportunity and more skill in destroying themselves. Now you can just do it more efficiently. We'll teach you how. Again, here's your list. In Mesopotamian thought, though, there's a story that, that is the backstory to all this. It's a story of, of a group of divine beings called the Apkalu. Now, right away, you have, to, you have to think like a Mesopotamian and think like an Israelite. Israelites are your, you know, your biblical crowd, followers of Yahweh, at least ostensibly. And the, Mes the Mesopotamians are followers of you know, any number of gods. Marduk is the big one, you know, when this gets written. He's the lead deity. So you've got Israel, Mesopotamia, you know, good and evil, all that stuff going on. Well, the Mesopotamian story of the flood includes the idea of supernatural beings coming to earth and cohabitation. But in their version, it's a good thing. This is why Babylon is known for its immorality, certainly its idolatry, for its dark arts. Okay, they were an empire. But those are good things because we're Babylon and we're great. There's no one like us. We are the top dog of civilization. And what the Babylonians wanted people to know is the reason we're so wonderful and so awesome and so unbeatable is because the gods helped us create Babylon. They give the gods credit. And in the Apkalu story, the Apkalu are thought of as culture heroes by the Mesopotamians, the great civilizers of their civilization the ones who taught the Babylonians all sorts of things to build their power. So they're heroes, they're good guys. These seven sages, there are seven of them, were created by other gods in the abyss. That ought to ring a bell. Okay? They're created in the abyss. They, one of their jobs was to ensure the correct functioning of heaven and earth. They had great power, great knowledge. And they're going to teach humans things, ostensibly to create civilization. But again, the Jews look at this and go, this is horrible. We shouldn't have random bloodshed. We shouldn't have immorality. We shouldn't be worshiping other gods. We shouldn't be doing any of this garbage. But if you're a Babylonian, you're like, yeah, sign me up for that. 
The wisdom taught by the Apkalu to the Babylonians corresponds precisely to the forbidden knowledge that you'll see listed in Enoch. That's not a coincidence. Again, negative view, positive view. The Apkalu, they also, archaeologists have discovered little figurines because the Apkalu, again, they're viewed as good guys. They're not viewed as sinister demonic figures by the Babylonians. They would make figures of the Apkalu and bury them in foundations of buildings to protect the building, you know, from whatever the Babylonians didn't like. And their name for those sculptures was Matsare in Akkadian. It means watchers. That's not a coincidence. Again, that's Enoch's term for the sons of God who fell before the flood. It's not a coincidence. He's getting it from Babylonian material. The higher gods in the Babylonian story one day, the Apkalu are kind of mid, mid-level deities. You know, they have important jobs, but they're not the ones who, who make the decisions. They're not the ones who call the shots. They just do stuff. They're real smart and do stuff. So the higher gods decide, you know, we're kind of sick of humans. You know, you read Enuma Elish or the Gilgamesh epic or something like that, you're going to get this story. You know, we're kind of sick of, of humans. They make a lot of noise. You know, they, they just, you know, it, this was just a bad idea. So, you know what, we're going to get rid of them. We're going to send a flood and wipe them out. And then the gods, you know, high-five each other and, ah, great idea, you know. What? Let's just get rid of them. Well, the Apkalu hear this and they're like, you got to be kidding. I mean, we've invested a lot of time in these people. You know, we've taught them all sorts of things. How in the world, I mean, all that work is going to be lost if we just, you know, if, if they just get destroyed. So they decide, well, okay, we can think of a way to sort of transmit our knowledge to human survivors of the flood, and then we can sort of start up again. Our work will not be lost. Now, the Era Epic, which is a Mesopotamian text, is a key source for this. It lists seven pre-flood kings, each of them accompanied by an assisting Apkalu. So the king said, I owe my success to this deity, and then they, you know, they list them out in a cuneiform tablet. Each king is assisted by a specific Apkalu, and they're all divine beings. But after the flood, there are texts that mention four of them, and they're no longer completely divine. They're of divine descent, but they're also described as partly human. Does this sound familiar? Okay, the Giborim, the Nephilim, okay. They're also described as other ways. They're two-thirds Apkalu is one description. That's the description given to Gilgamesh, who is called in one cylinder seal, the Lord of the Apkalu, and Gilgamesh is a giant in Mesopotamian tradition. Does that sound familiar? Divine beings, cohabitation, offspring that's mixed, they're giants, and you know, they're, they're just bad dudes. Okay, the Babylonians think, well, this is great, good idea. You know, you, you save civilization here. In the Israelite version in Genesis 6, it's like, this is awful. Because what do the Nephilim and their succeeding generations do? Numbers 13, 32, 33. When Joshua, along with 11 others, you know, Joshua and Caleb and 10 other spies, are sent into the land... They come back in Numbers 13, 32, and 33 and say what? What do the spies say? This place is awesome. Like, it's everything we heard it was going to be. And the people are like, yeah. And, and, the, and the ten of the spies go, no. <laughs> because, because there's one other detail here. The place is littered with Anakim, who are descended from the Nephilim. Great and tall, essentially, we're going to get our butts kicked. Okay, we do not stand a chance. And Joshua and Caleb are like, don't you remember like the Red Sea? Like, hello. But 10 of them say, we're out of here. And so God says, because you don't believe, 
You're going to wander in the wilderness now for 40 years until this generation dies out.
Now, getting a little ahead of myself for the next session. After 40 years, remember what God does? See, the conquest fails when they see the Anakim, the giants. In Deuteronomy 2 and 3, says the Anakim are Rephaim. Again, all these different giant clan names. God takes them up the other side of Jordan and they pass through Ammon and Moab and, and God tells you know, Joshua, Moses and Joshua in Deuteronomy, now go up, go through Ammon and Moab, but don't bother those people because the descendants of Esau have already eliminated the giant clan, clans there, the Zamzumim, the, Z the Zuzim, and the Amim. So you don't have any business there. Don't bother them. I'm going to send you to Bashan, where the last of the Rephaim live. God intentionally takes them back to confront the same people they ran away from. They have to conquer Bashan, the vestiges of the giant clans in Bashan, before God allows them to cross over and then do the same thing in Canaan. He brings them full circle. You're not getting out of this deal because th this is, these are the elements of the population in the, in the conquest narrative. These must be eliminated because they are spawn of rival gods. They want to seduce you to idolatry. They want to destroy you because you're my people. You say, well, how in the world did we get into that situation? Like where all these nations have other gods. I mean, how did we even get there to begin with? Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. That's Babel. But in Jewish tradition, here's where demons come from, the demons of the Gospels, who are not the principalities and powers. We'll see that in a moment, too. In Jewish tradition, if you asked, where do the demons come from? This is it. Because when the Rephaim die, where do we see them in the Old Testament? Sheol. A demon is the disembodied spirit of one of these guys. That was the belief in Judaism. And again, you can read it all through Second Temple Jewish text. And, I, and I'm sure that, that maybe there's some of you who have heard that before. But again, this isn't taught in church because you're not encouraged to read the text that Peter and Jude read that wind up you know, getting drawn on for material in the New Testament. You don't read Isaiah 14. You don't read about the Rephaim. You don't read about Sheol. You know, again, this is your biblical worldview. So you've got one rebel who brings death and estrangement to humanity. That's the one you know about. That's the serpent. You've got this crowd who rebel against God. Now God, in, in all traditions, God takes the offenders and assigns them, sends them back to the abyss. In the Mesopotamian story, that's what Marduk does. Marduk says, look, I wanted humanity destroyed. I didn't want you guys interfering. So I'm going to sentence you to go back to the abyss to never return. Every element of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is accounted for in the Apkalo story, every one. And it's only really been since 2010 that scholars who muck around in cuneiform tablets have assembled the data. So by definition, if you have a commentary at home that doesn't include what I just talked about, I'm sorry, but it's obsolete in Genesis 6. It does not take into consideration the primary source text material that is the backdrop for Genesis 6, 1 through 4. That isn't my fault, I'm just pointing it out. Okay, it's, it's just, this is what happens. People discover things and you learn more things. There was a time when the Dead Sea Scrolls that were unknown. 1947, 48, you know, we, we've learned lots through them. It's the same thing over here. Now we understand why Peter and Jude could read Enoch and go, oh, you know, we get it because in, in, in the book of the giants, Gilgamesh is actually mentioned by name as a giant. What a coincidence. There are Jewish people who are serious about the Old Testament and they preserve the backstories, the context of the Old Testament in all sorts of ways and they write about their discoveries, they write about you know, the, the dots they're connecting, they do exegesis, they do interpretation. This is what Jewish thinkers are doing in this 500 year gap. They're studying the Old Testament and they have access to lots of material to help them understand it. And New Testament writers like Peter and Jude, they read some of that stuff 
and they bring it into the New Testament because it helps them make an argument. In Peter and Jude's case, who do they compare? Who are the angels that sin? What are they a foil for? False teachers. Wouldn't it make sense to equate a false teacher with like an Apkalu dude or one of the fallen sons of God because they were believed to lead people astray? Why in the Gospels are demons called unclean spirits? It's because they don't take a bath. Because okay, they eat like stuff they shouldn't. No. What are, other than like, you know, like food laws in the Old Testament, what are some other things that make something, either an animal or a person, unclean? Forbidden mixtures. This is why the watchers are called bastard spirits in the Dead Sea Scrolls, because that's what they are. And they're unclean spirits. I could cite you sources where, where guys write their dissertation on the phrase unclean spirit. Where does it come from? How is it used? That will make this point. It's just, again, this is what I try to do. I try to give, you know, scholarly material, make it decipherable, because it, it, is, it is kind of important in terms of the worldview of what we're talking about. You have the lesson to learn from Genesis 6, ultimately, is not about giant stuff. I mean, people love that stuff, but it's really not about giant stuff. It's about understanding that you have supernatural enemies who enjoy your destruction. It's about your living a legacy that is partly your fault, but partly one imposed upon you by intelligent evil. Now, you can say, well, all those guys are locked up in the abyss, you know, and they are, okay? They are. Demons are at times allowed to get out, like in the Gospels, and they possess people. They harm individuals. That's not our real problem. Our real problem is the next set, which are different. But the idea that there is intelligent evil out there that seeks your destruction is an important one. Now, when it comes to the biblical story, it's kind of interesting. Who destroys the, the lineage of the Nephilim in the Bible, in the Old Testament? Okay, Moses and Joshua in the conquest. And then the last, in fact, Joshua winds up his conquest narrative, narrative this way. How does Joshua define success? It's in Joshua uh, 12, jo or Joshua 11, 21, 22. It says, there are no more Anakim in the land except the ones that escaped to the Philistine cities. <laughs> Where do we find the vestiges of them later on? It's Goliath, he's, he's from one of these cities. Goliath has you know, some brothers too. It's David's men who take care, and David of course, of the rest of the line. Isn't it fascinating that Moses, Joshua, and David, who are three archetypal figures of the Messiah, wind up destroying the giant clan? That's not a coincidence. Moses, the Messiah is the prophet like unto Moses. Joshua, it's Yeshua. I mean, how clear can that be? Okay, you know, captain of the Lord's host and all that. And of course, David, the man after God's own heart, the messianic archetype. Again, none of this stuff is, is, is coincidence. It's designed to get you to think in a certain way, in this case about evil. The messianic role is telegraphed, you know, somewhat cryptically. Now, again, we don't have time to go into all these things, but you can you could go to YouTube. God forbid I send you to YouTube. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm on YouTube so many times and don't know how I got there. I just, but if Google, Google my name and like the time of Jesus' birth, there is specific imaging about the timing of Jesus' birth in the times and the seasons, that is a direct polemic. It's a theological poke in the eye to the Watcher story. There are women in Jesus' genealogies whose lives mimic the circumstances of either sexual rebellion or cri sexual crimes committed to them. All four of the, of the women in Jesus' genealogy have that. 
You know, you get Paul's reference in Galatians 3, 19, 20. The law was added because of transgressions. Plural. So it's not like Adam and Eve, because they do like one thing. What if the transgressions we're talking about here are the crimes of the watchers? Because Galatians 3 goes into chapter 4 and talks about the timing of Jesus. In the fullness of time, the Son of God was born. You actually, again, and if you read Unseen Realm, you're going to get all this, but there are actually Jewish texts that develop that thought that the law was added to circumscribe or put, the, put halters on, put boundaries around human self-destruction that was proliferated as a result of what happened here before the flood. The law is added to help humans slow down in their self-destruction, is the point. Again, I'm not inventing any of these ideas. This is all ancient material that provides context for what Paul's saying and other writers. And, you know, I know Stovall just preached, a, or recently preached a message on 1 Peter 3. Why does Peter mix the fall, or not the fall, but the flood, the, the angels that sinned, the spirits in prison, Noah, the ark, and the resurrection. I mean, like, what, what is he on? I mean, what, what is this guy thinking of? Did he just say, I need a chapter to write, I'm going to take all these things, toss them in the blender, and hit the switch? And then we'll just write, write something. No, all of those things are related in his mind because of this whole issue. The resurrection deals with depravity because you have a resurrection and ascension and then the Spirit comes to indwell people to help them not destroy themselves. Again, all these things are connected. The big one in many ways is the last one here. The third rebellion. This is the Sunday school story we all know but we never see because again, we're cut off from some material. We all know the story of Babel, Genesis 11, 1, 9. What we don't know is this one. When the Most High, again, that's not a brain teaser. We know who that is. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, and when he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, Wait a minute, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance and divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God? But the Lord's portion, but Yahweh's portion, is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. Okay, when, were the, when was humanity divided into nations? That would be Babel. So when God did that, when he punished humanity because he wanted them to overspread the earth, God repeats the Edenic mandate after the flood to Noah and his sons, and it's from his sons that all the nations in Genesis 10, you know, derive from in some way. Instead of overspreading the earth, though, they congregated a place called Babel and they built a tower you know, to make themselves a great name. So God says, okay, this is like the opposite of what I asked you to do. So we've, let, me, let me get this straight, God says. We had a fall in Eden. You got expelled from that, and that meant death and estrangement from, from me, your father and your creator. Then we unfortunately had another supernatural rebellion to deal with, Genesis 6, 1 through 4. The result of that was the proliferation of evil and wickedness and depravity among the human population that was so great that I looked down and I saw that every inclination of the human heart was only evil continually. That's Genesis 6, 5. So I sent a flood, but we saved a remnant out of the flood. And I gave them 120 years to repent, but basically nobody did. But now, you know, when you guys get out of the art and, and, and you have kids, I, I come, I show up and I repeat the Edenic mandate because there is no plan B. We're sticking with plan A here. I want 
a family. I want you and my family, I want to return to earth, and I want the earth to become Eden. But it has to start right here. Okay, you, you, you gotta start with the original job. You've got to be loyal to me. Obey. You're not gonna earn your salvation if you believe that I am the most high, that I am your creator, I am your father. You believe that I want the things that, that you want. I want to give them to you. If you believe that, that I am who I say I am, let's get with the plan here. Be my partner. Be my child, be my partner. And so what does humanity do? Now, we'd like to build a tower. You know, be because, because if we build a tower, then like we're gonna become famous. So now it's a little more than that because everybody agrees, biblical scholars agree that the tower they built is, was a ziggurat. If you know a little bit about ziggurats, it helps. Ziggurats were part of temple complexes in ancient Mesopotamia. You built a ziggurat to connect heaven and earth and you would meet at that place to offer sacrifice and barter with the god or the gods. A ziggurat, part of a temple complex, was something you built to bring the deity to you. God's like, that's really not the idea. Okay, I don't come at your beck and call. Okay, the, the God of Israel will not be tamed. This is what the thinking was about building, you know, these temple complexes. And God says, okay, here we are again. You don't want to be loyal to me. You don't want me to be your God. You don't want these things. I'm gonna give you what you apparently are asking for. I'm gonna give you a divorce. I'm gonna disinherit you. I'm gonna cut you off from me. I'm gonna disperse you and divide you up geographically, and I'm going to assign each of you, each of the nations, to one of the sons of God. And, you know, they're going to get assigned to you too. And what I want them to do, again, this is wider in the Old Testament, what I want them to do is I want them to essentially be placeholders. I still love humanity. I don't want humanity enslaved and destroyed and corrupted and basically ground into dust. And I certainly don't want humans to worship the other gods because I'm their maker. So what I want is I want the nations ruled justly according to you know, my character and my principles, but I'm done with you. I'm gonna judge your wickedness and we're gonna see how that goes. In the meantime, verse nine, here's what we're gonna do. There is no plan B. So what I'm going to do, if you're not willing to be loyal to me, is I'm going to create more humans. I'm going to take one guy from Ur, his name is Abram, and his wife is Sarah, and they're perfect because they can't have kids. <laughs> they're perfect because I'm going to supernaturally enable them to have a child so that everybody knows this nation, their descendants exist because of my power. That's what we're gonna do. So, this is, this is what he does. What happens in the biblical storyline right after Babel? Genesis 12, what is it? It's the covenant with Abram. So God is still interested in the nations because when he makes a covenant with Abram and he promises him a seed, he says, it's gonna be through your seed that all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. And you know, Paul later on picks up on this idea and he talks about, well, the seed was actually like one seed, it was Jesus, and of course he has, goes all the way back through Abraham and you know, the genealogies and all that stuff. And it's gonna be the Messiah who is going to reunite the earth, reunite the nations. This is the plan. So God abandons them. Now what this leads to, if you again know, if you want good bedtime reading, you can read my article about Deuteronomy 32.8. 
Now, most of your Bibles will say sons of Israel. He divided them up according to the number of the sons of Israel or the children of Israel. The Dead Sea Scrolls say sons of God. Here I made you a nice little picture of the Dead Sea Scroll. If you read Hebrew, it's B'nai Elohim, sons of God. And I, I talk about the scroll in that article. But you don't need to be a textual critic. Think about the story. The nations are divided at Babel and they're divided up according to the sons of Israel. Israel didn't exist yet. They're only going to exist after Babel. So it makes no sense to divide the nations up according to the number of the sons of Israel because Israel, what, what's that? They don't even exist. Again, the, the correct reading is sons of God like the Dead Sea Scrolls have. It's the oldest text we have and so we, we should go with it. ESV goes with it, NLT, NRSV. I mean, some of your mainline translations have incorporated the Dead Sea Scrolls into that passage, and they should, because it makes a lot of sense. Now, ultimately what happens here, let's go back to Psalm 82. You know, Israel, the, the plan is that God has abandoned the nations, and Israel is supposed to be his family, and his family is supposed to be Think of how Israel is described in the Old Testament. A kingdom of priests. There's one. What do priests do? They, they're mediators between God and men. Yeah, sure. Don't lose your thought. Okay. Just because so many people don't know, I want them to understand. When you're saying in the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. you're talking about the biblical text. The biblical wanna, text. When he says Dead yeah. Sea Scrolls, he's talking about the Bible that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that is the oldest text that we have. This is, this is Deuteronomy 32 preserved in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that's a good point. The, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, two categories, biblical and non-biblical. Biblical scrolls are copies of the Hebrew Bible. Non-biblical stuff is stuff that's not the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> so it's real easy to remember. But if you go to Psalm 82, Again, Israel was supposed to be the mediator between God, the true God, and all these other nations. See, the, what happens at Babel is the Old Testament explanation for why the other nations have other gods, where pantheons come from. Because the sons of God who are given charge over the nations don't do a good job. Here's what they do. We, we read it earlier today in Psalm 82. God is judging the gods in his counsel. How long will you judge unjustly? Show partiality to the wicked. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. I mean, you're not doing all this stuff. And the result is, look at what's in. You know, your people have neither knowledge or understanding. They walk about in darkness. The whole foundations of the earth are shaken. Okay, what I wanted was for you to rule justly because I still love humanity. And I want to use my new people, Israel, to be a conduit of truth to them, from me to them, and bring them back into the family. But, but what you're doing is resulting in chaos throughout the whole earth. The psalm ends with the psalmist saying, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. The psalmist wants this to end. He wants the chaos of the nations taken care of. The reason I have this highlighted, again, we, we can't go into this either, but in the, if you know what the Septuagint is, it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The word here for arise in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible is the word for resurrection. And it, it happens three or four times where the resurrection is associated with the reclaiming of the nations. This is just one of several passages. And Paul knows this. He knows it really well. Because five or six times, Paul, when he talks about the resurrection, he doesn't talk about being his ideal weight. He doesn't talk about getting his hair back, getting better eyesight. Or he, when he, as soon as he thinks of the resurrection, he thinks about the conquest of the rulers, the powers, the principalities. He does it half a dozen different places. He thinks of one and goes to the other. Now, again, this is the way it was supposed to work, but it doesn't work this way. And what this is, this is the root, and we'll cover this in the last five minutes here. This whole idea of God scattering the nations, assigning them to other gods, and those gods 
become corrupt. They destroy their nations. They turn the hearts of their people to worship them. They turn the hearts of people to idolatry. It's a mess. It's the Old Testament explanation for after the flood, everybody knew who the true God was. After Babel, things just really go downhill. Okay. It turns into the system that, that, that we sort of know about the ancient world. You know, you, you, could go to, you could go to Plato and find the same worldview. You can go to Greco-Roman writers. The pagan world believed the same thing, that they worship the gods they do and their neighbors worship some other god because that's how the Most High wanted it. You'll actually find that in, in non-biblical pagan texts. Again, Paul, when, when Paul goes to a pagan city, he knows that they share the same worldview. That, that's, it's a platform for the gospel. But before we get there, that, that's going to be the subject of the next session. This is the foundation for what we call spiritual warfare and cosmic geography. Daniel 10, the prince of Persia, prince of Greece. Where do we get this idea of supernatural princes over nations? Deuteronomy 32 the Babel story. That's where it begins. 1 Samuel 5, this is one of my favorites because it's one of the most obscure, but it's funny. Remember the story when the Philistines go to war with the Israelites and they capture the Ark of the Covenant? Okay, so what do they do? They take the Ark of the Covenant back to the Temple of Dagon, Right? And, and they set it up in the temple of Dagon. And again, this is a familiar Sunday school story that we like to tell kids. Again, because it's funny, I'll have to go to, let me just flip over and go to 1 Samuel 5, because there's a line in it that we all miss. So they, they take the ark over to Dagon's temple. Might help if I put the chapter in. And here's the story. They took Dagon, put, it, you know, it, you know, put, put the ark in front of Dagon. Verse 3 when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they, when they rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen down, you know, face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And this time, if I can find my mouse here, the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Now, that's the story we tell, because it's funny. Dagon is reduced to a stump. And it, granted, okay, it's comical, but we miss the next verse. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Where they found Dagon defeated, they don't walk on it because now that ground is under dominion of Yahweh. In other words, can you, can you imagine? I mean, this must have been like some pirouette because you, you gotta go into Dagon's house to do stuff. And so like, well, we just gotta kind of step around that, you know, like you know, cordon it off or whatever, because they're not taking any chances. They're not taking any chances. It is now ground that belongs to Yahweh. See, the nations around Israel are under dominion of fallen gods. Israel is Yahweh's portion. And Yahweh, when he, when he does things like this and conquers other deities, they get it. 1 Samuel 26, when David gets driven out of Judah, you know, he, if, we, if we click through that, he has this lament, and he's, he's basically shedding tears over well, good grief, you know, I have to leave Judah and I gotta go pretend I'm a crazy man over in Philistine territory, you know, because Saul hates me, they hate me, you know, how am I gonna stay alive? And he, he laments that, you know, how can I worship the Lord? How can I pray? Because I'm no longer in Judah. It's not a denial of God's omnipresence. That's the way a modern would think about it. He's thinking, for me to be rightly related to God, I have to be in his land. I have to be in his space, sacred space. 
2 Kings 5, my, probably my favorite example. This is Naaman the leper. Again, how many times have we heard this in Sunday school? So Naaman has leprosy. And he's got a little slave girl living in his house that they captured from Israel. And I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, she's doing whatever task she's doing. And here comes Naaman, the captain of Syria. He's a big dude. And he's whining about his leprosy. I mean, I'd whine too if I had leprosy. And the little slave girl says, well, why don't you just go down and see Elisha the prophet? Like, he'll take care of that. And he's like, what? Sure, just, you know, go down and visit Elisha. So he takes a bunch of his men and he goes to Elisha in Israel. And he gets to Elisha's house and the prophet won't even come out to talk to him. He says, yeah, I know, I know he's here. I know who he is. Just tell him to go dip in the Jordan seven times. He'll be okay. So Naaman's like, this is disrespectful. You know, doesn't he like know who I am? And he gets all in a huff, you know, we're just going to go back home, you know. And again, his servants say, well, again, Mike's paraphrase. Well, if he'd have told you to do something crazy, you probably would have done it. Oh, yeah, you know. But the Jordan is like, you know, we got better rivers back home. You know, what, what is this thing? It's like a little sewer or something, you know. And, and his men say, well, what's the harm? Just try it. So he says, okay, I'll try it and then we'll go home. So he dips himself seven times in the Jordan. What happens? I mean, you know the story. He's healed. So he, he, he can't believe it. You know, he's, he's thrilled. He goes back to Elisha's house, and this time Elisha comes out to talk to him. And, you know, Naaman's like, you know, thank you, I can't believe it. You know, can I give you something? Can I pay you something? I mean, this is just amazing. And Elisha's like, no, 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 we're not doing any of that. And so Naaman says, now I know that Yahweh is the God of all gods. And he says, from this point forward, I will not sacrifice to any other. And then what does he ask Elisha for? Anybody remember? Is this the part of the story we, we skip over? He asks him for dirt. He said, would it be okay if I fill the you know, bags of, you know, with dirt and as much as my mule train can carry, take it back? Because I'm an important guy. I've got to go home to Syria. And part of my job is I have to go into the temple of Ramon with the king. And the king's kind of old. And when the king bends over, I've got to do this, you know. It's, but I want, you know, he wants God to know and he wants Elisha to know that I'm not worshiping Ramon. Now, he probably used the dirt to spread out at his house somewhere to offer sacrifice on what? Cosmic geography, on, on holy ground, land under dominion of, of the God he knew was real. I mean, you know, maybe he took some with him in the temple of Ramon, like, you know, put a little bag, put some in my pockets, you know. I mean, who knows? but he wants dirt. I mean, you, you can't understand the, the impact of that whole scene without Deuteronomy 32. This is Yahweh's portion. He has dominion over this land. We are attached to him and his land. Everything else is hostile. It's under dominion of something else. Deuteronomy 32 frames the entire rest of the Bible. Because from this point on, it's Israel against the nations, and it's Yahweh against the gods. That's the whole story right there in a nutshell. It frames the entirety of the Old Testament. And since this is where we get the Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece, all this stuff, Okay, that gets picked up in the New Testament, both in the life of Jesus and in what Paul says and in our ultimate destiny, believe it or not. All those things bleed back into what we just talked about. 